Uh, thank you, Dr. Gleeb. Uh, I am presenting on penile cancer today, and, and the reason I chose this topic is I found that I came across um, somewhat uh, more frequently than I, I expected uh, cases during my chief, and um, I realized that we don't do a lot of coverage on this topic uh, generally, and uh, it is quite interesting, and the presentations were all very, very interesting. So uh, on that note, um, I am going to start with um, a case presentation for the uh, first one. Uh, for, for the for, uh, at first, I'm going to talk about this uh, man who presented a 34 year old obese man who was scheduled to have uh, treatment of his buried penis. Um, he came in about a, a you know a week earlier um, prior to his scheduled appointment uh, with worsening pain, skin swelling, and uh, peril and discharge from the side of the buried penis and. Uh, he uh, was describing a six-month progressive uh, right groin pain with abscesses noted on ultrasound around the phallus. And he had previous INDs at his regional hospital. Um, should be noted this 34-year-old uh, was uh, very obese, BMI of 56, uh, with uh, previous inguinal hernia sur uh, surgery and then a recurrence, uh, recurring UTIs. Uh, he had asthma, OSA, um, and was a non-smoker and uncircumcised. So uh, the pictures that you see in the top left and the bottom right are uh, prior to uh, his presentation to for the infection. This was just on his assessment for the buried penis. But when he showed up to the hospital, he was afebrile but hypotensive and tachycardic. Um, he had a buried penis with small um, skin opening and just to the left uh, left side of it with peril and discharge and uh, significant induration and erythema of the anterior scrotum um, and the fat pad. Imaging showed um, what we, you know, had seen previously with a buried penis within the adipose tissue and this heterogeneously uh, enhancing mass uh, in the region of the glands of the penis and um, large bilateral inguinal lymph nodes that had actually increased in size from a previous city about a month ago from three to six centimeters. And he also had bilateral pelvic side uh, sidewall uh, bilateral pelvic lymph nodes measuring up to one centimeter. Uh, we took this man uh, to the OR uh, for uh, treatment of his uh, potentially forniase, and uh, we noted multiple loculations filled with uh, purulent fluid and. Uh, very difficult to find the penis itself, the glands, um, and the tissue around the glands was very abnormal. So this was uh, sent to core pathology intraoperatively. Um, and uh, we were able to uh, eventually identify the meatus, put a catheter in, and uh, performed a proximal dissection that showed normal appearing corporal bodies. Uh, the left inguinal hernia had bowel content in it, so it was very difficult to actually maneuver anything around, uh, around that. And we um, noted that uh, we, we, we then uh, left that as, as is. Uh, the pathology uh, report uh, from this uh, tissue from the glands showed uh, grade three uh, uh, invasive squamous cell carcinoma, uh, T3 with uh, invasion to the cor uh, corpus cavernosum and distal urethra. And uh, he also went on to have a core biopsy of the left inguinal lymph node, uh, the largest one, uh, which showed uh, also uh, squamous cell carcinoma. This uh, was N3. Uh, we'll talk about the staging a little bit later. Uh, we ended up uh, doing a temporary closure with a vac uh, on this gentleman because uh, we were not quite sure exactly what the, the final diagnosis would be. And uh, then when he was taken back, uh, he underwent a palliative penectomy just for symptom control and closure of the urethra. And um, he was presented at the multidisciplinary rounds with uh, radiation and medical oncologist. And the decision was made to uh, proceed with chemotherapy once he has healed. Um, however, uh, no more surgical um, management at, at that point until uh, further assessment. I understand that he had a recent CT that also showed that he has had further progression since the time of the OR. Uh, I, uh, overall, uh, the objectives of this presentation are to uh, briefly talk about epidemiology and risk factors of penile cancer. I will uh, briefly touch on an, uh, an anatomical uh, review and then uh, we'll chat about the pathology of the penile cancer, uh, penile cancer and uh, move on to diagnosis and staging followed by management. And I'll touch on some um, future directions when it comes to penile cancer. Uh, 
the uh, uh, well, I should say that penile cancer is actually a fairly rare cancer, and uh, it occurs mostly in the fifth decade of life, um, uh, uh, fifth to seventh decade of life, and um, with the incidence of about one in a hundred thousand people in uh, industrialized nations. Uh, but this seems to be higher among uh, in Asian countries, in South America, and in Africa. And uh, high rates of penile lesions have also been reported with, in patients with HIV as well as HPV. When it comes to uh, risk factors, um, the risk factors, uh, the, uh, the most common being circumcision and phimosis. And um, HPV uh, is found in approximately 50% of these patients uh, that present with penile cancer. Uh, low socioeconomic status, uh, which may uh, tie into the poor um, hygiene and uh, chronic inflammatory conditions such as BXO and uh, psoriasis even, and smoking are considered to be risk factors. And uh, the lifetime risk de of developing cancer among uncircumcised male population is um, approximately one in 4,500 uh, 4, as opposed to one in 100,000. It's estimated that, um, or it's uh, been shown that uh, HPV serotypes 16 and 18 are most commonly associated with uh, uh, this malignant degeneration um, of the penis with, numbers, uh, with uh, HPV uh, serotype 16 being um, the more common of the, of the two. And um, there, uh, there, while this is occurring um, in any patient, it, again, as I mentioned, uncircumcised males are at a higher risk um, as compared to um, other patients. And um, it should be noted that uh, there are also vaccines uh, that are being uh, developed for HPV that which may, be, which may benefit patients uh, and also in prevention. Now, I'll just chat quickly about the um, anatomy of the penis. Uh, and I should note that penile cancers um, uh, arise mostly, approximately 95% of penile cancers arise from the squamous cell um, epithelium of the dermis and the epidermis um, of the penis. Now, beneath the uh, penile shaft skin uh, arises a superficial uh, fascia, uh, which is the dartos, followed by Bux fascia, and within these layers are the superficial and deep dorsal veins and dorsal artery. It's between uh, these two layers that the mobility of the overlying skin of the penile shaft arises due to the loose connective tissue um, uh, between the dartos and Bux fascia. And this is in contrast to the uh, glands of the penis where the epidermis and dermis um, are attached to the tunica albiginia in these cases. Uh, within Bux fascia are the two cavernosal bodies and dorsal and solitary spongios uh, the, uh, spon spongiosum uh, that's placed ventrally. And uh, Bux fascia fuses uh, with the tunica albiginia both distally at the corona of the glands and then proximally at the level of the deep bulbospongiosis and ischiocavernosus muscles. And uh, we definitely must talk about the lymphatic drainage of the penis because it does uh, play a big part in um, the metastatic spread uh, of penile cancer. And it, is no, uh, it should be noted that lymphatic drainage is, um, appears to be unpredictable in terms of laterality. So there's no laterality, whereas you know, in, te in testis cancer, you see uh, left side mostly going to the left and right side to the right. Uh, this is not, in, in fact, the case, um, and you see great crossover. With, uh, when it comes to pathology of penile cancer, it's, uh, it should be divided. It really is, uh, comes to division between premalignant or CIS versus um, invasive carcinoma. Uh, penile intraepithelial neoplasia is now a term uh, that's an all-encompassing um, uh, description that's used to describe um, penile, uh, the uh, CIS, as well as Bowen's disease, Bowenoid papulosis, and erythroplasia of uh, Kara, which, um, but again, most commonly in the clinical setting, um, we just refer to it, all of it as CIS. And uh, this um, penile intraepithelial neoplasia uh, presents in two forms. 
Um, we have the uh, differentiated and undifferentiated and differentiated is typically associated with inflammatory conditions such as BXO, whereas the undifferentiated is typically so associated with HPV and uh, presents with um, a basaloid um, or warty or mixed basaloid subtypes. Now, uh, when it comes to invasive um, penile carcinoma, it usually begins with a small lesion that gradually extends uh, the uh, entire glands and shaft and corpora. And um, oftentimes, uh, the, uh, the, these are found on the glands and the prepuce, um, and only about 9% uh, originate on the shaft, and the remainder are uh, a combination of uh, glands and shaft. Lesions are uh, described on their appearance and pattern of growth, um, and those are the, the the subtypes are superficial spreading, vertical growth, uh, verrucoform, multicentric, and mixed. Now, um, we well, I'll move on to uh, discussing the uh, invasive subtypes of uh, penile uh, cancer, and uh, when it comes to squamous cell carcinoma. Um, the usual or uh, keratinizing subtypes is, uh, is, is the most common type uh, found in 60% of the cases and it's moderately differentiated um, and it has a relatively high metastatic rate from uh, 28 to 39%. And um, all the other cases are compared to the usual um, subtype. And um, with that, uh, the Verrucus uh, uh, cunical, uh, cunical Caniculatum, sorry, that one always trips me up. And the pseudohyperplastic have a low risk of met, uh, metastatic um, spread and have low risk and are not really associated with um, disease specific death. Warty and papillary subtypes are often associated with metastatic uh, rates of about 20%, but overall, uh, overall uh, a lower mortality rate. And um, uh, a subtype that's uh, identified as um, adenosquamous is um, a malignant tumor that's normally found in the salivary glands um, uh, or, uh, uh, and, or esophagus or lacrimal ducts or upper respiratory tract and um, rarely in the penis. Um, uh, and it's of bimodal origin with this periurethral uh, mucin producing cells near the urethra and uh, it's mostly described um, in case studies because there's not really a high incidence of the, uh, these cases. And in those cases, even though it has a high metastatic potential and it's, uh, seen, it's found in 50% uh, of the cases to be metastatic, it, um, it doesn't have a high uh, uh, or it doesn't have a high mortality rate because in these cases in long-term follow-up, Patients who, uh, patients who had uh, treatment of their metastatic disease of their lymph nodes actually uh, ended up having fairly high survival rates uh, at the five and 10 year mark. Uh, the worst prognosis is often dis uh, associated with basaloid and uh, sarcomatoid subtypes uh, with uh, metastatic spread seen to up to 100% of the patients um, and most of these patients succumb to disease. Now, uh, with the clinical diagnosis of um, penile cancer, you know, as we do with anything else, a good history um, is very important. Um, a focused and detailed history uh, to ask patients about uh, prior history of circumcision. And again, this is whether this is prior to or post-pubertal. Um, history of balanitis um, or other inflammatory conditions prior penile trauma, sexually transmitted diseases, um, history of tobacco use, phimosis, and even STDs in partners would be important. And when, uh, when it comes to the physical exam, uh, the size, location, and fixation of the tumor should be noted. And um, on exam, uh, it, it should be, it, we, we most often would be able to, especially in bigger tumors, uh, assess the involvement of the corporal bodies and the morphology of the tumor. Now, uh, inspection of the base of the penis and the scrotum are also important uh, to ensure that there isn't spread, uh, you know, in terms of T4 disease. And uh, a rectal and bimanual examination is also uh, recommended, although um, oftentimes these patients end up getting public CTs anyways. And uh, 
Um, most importantly, I think a careful uh, bilateral palpation of inguinal lymph nodes is uh, very important. And the description of whether or not they're small or grossly evident, if they're mobile or fixed, um, and if there's any um, evidence of underlying infection. For when it comes to investigations, uh, the biopsy is the gold standard, um, and uh, that includes either a punch biopsy, incisional biopsy, or excisional biopsy. And uh, these are oftentimes done in the um, office. And uh, although biopsy will help uh, determine the pathology, uh, the histopathology of the tumor and the grading, um, in combination with um, other modalities, including penile imaging, um, it might um, be more beneficial. Uh, there was a study by uh, the Dutch group uh, led by Horan Blas um, that showed that physical exam uh, by itself uh, is insufficient and incorrectly established uh, actual pathologic or uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, pathologic uh, state in 26% of the cases with understaging about 10% um, of the cases and overstaging in 16%. And um, they found that uh, an ultrasound examination um, can, uh, is, is also insufficient on its own. Uh, so they did report that you know, an ultrasound is not good enough because it often underestimates the thickness of the uh, tumor and um, it, it isn't uh, helpful for determining uh, T1 versus T2 when it comes to the glands of the penis. But um, uh, Devaris and colleagues in 2019 recommended combining physical exam and a Doppler in order to, uh, in, and in combination, these actually, uh, this seems to yield fairly good results. Uh, when it comes to lymph nodes, um, imaging um, is, is, you know, historically not recommended in patients that don't have non-palpable lymph nodes, but um, as um, in discussion with Dr. Black, you know, this has been challenged uh, in favor of imaging um, of often of just the pelvis because it seems to be fairly low um, in terms of uh, any morbidity and uh, long-term uh, effects and it, infer it gives a lot of information. And uh, when it comes to patients who are, uh, who have had previous inguinal uh, lymph node um, or inguinal uh, surgery or uh, patients who are obese as such as the case of the patient that um, I presented earlier, uh, CT or MRI are useful um, in evaluating uh, these cases. Yeah, can I say something since you're, you're using my name? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I think an exam answer is very clearly still that uh, the physical exam of the inguinal nodes is better than a CT. Um, I just think with, uh, but you can see that the study here is relatively old um, yeah. and, and it, it's sort of old dogma. And I think most people would say that it just doesn't make sense not to do a CT because exam, you know, you're, you are going to miss things. Um, and in this day and age where everybody gets a scan for everything, it, I, I think most penile cancer patients, invasive penile cancer patients will get a CT of the pelvis. Yeah. Exa exam answer is still that still, the physical no, exam is no better. Image. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, when it comes to uh, staging, uh, it's important to note, uh, so I, I actually um, put the picture up from the uh, 2010, uh, that was, a, uh, that was the, the latest update from the um, AJCC, what is in, from 2017, and previous to that it was in 2010. And the big distinction between those two um, staging groups uh, when it comes to the T staging is between T2 and T3, where uh, in the most recent uh, staging, T2 is uh, any tumor that's invading into the corpus uh, spongiosum uh, with or without urethral invasion, whereas uh, in the previous one, it was tumor uh, invading into the corpus spongiosum or cavernosum. And uh, T3 is now a uh, tumor invading into the corpora cavern uh, cavernosum with or without urethral invasion, whereas previously it was actually tumors invading into the urethra, as you can see in the image as well. Uh, when it comes to uh, the prognostic, uh, you know, uh, staging and prognosis, um, it's uh, prognosis is actually very important in terms of, uh, or staging is important in terms of prognostication. And uh, you can see that with uh, 
patients who have a nodal disease, uh, if they have more positive lymph nodes, uh, greater than two generally, uh, they are found to have uh, a much lower uh, five-year survival rate as compared to uh, patients who have um, less than two, uh, equal or less than two uh, positive lymph nodes. And um, also when, with regard to pelvic, uh, pelvic lymph nodes, I just wanted to touch base on that as well quickly. Um, patients were found to have a very poor five-year survival. And um, when I looked at the studies that reported this, um, for the most part, these studies were looking at patients who had pelvic lymph nodes uh, or pelvic lymph node dissection done. And this wasn't based on just imaging. It was actually done uh, based on uh, positive lymph nodes on pelvic lymph node dissection. Um, management of, uh, so the next, and the next thing I'm going to talk about is, uh, the management of penile cancer and, uh, the, that starts with management of the primary tumor followed by the management of inguinal lymph nodes and, um, then followed by metastatic disease. Uh, it's very, very important to note that, um, the clinical stage of the lesion ultimately determines the mode of treatment, um, and uh, in this case, I'll start by uh, touching uh, base with, uh, or uh, touching on the TIS and TA, which is um, sort of within the, um, low, uh, the uh, low clinical uh, disease or low grade clinical disease. And um, in these cases, uh, often topical therapy, wide lo local excision, laser therapy, um, and much less commonly, uh, Total, uh, complete uh, glenzectomy or most uh, surgery are performed. Uh, now, in terms of topical therapy, uh, 5-FU um, and uh, IQ are the two most uh, common agents. And uh, 5-FU is applied twice daily for two to six weeks. Um, and uh, IQ is uh, applied uh, three times a week. Um, for, uh, for four to 16 weeks. Again, these are messy treatments and um, not often used unless the uh, disease is actually just uh, carcinoma in situ or TA disease and generally smaller in size. Uh, laser therapy or laser or photodynamic um, therapy uh, are a couple of other things that are uh, mentioned. And uh, they're often done either with as a monotherapy or in, com uh, in combination with local excision of the mass or tumor. Uh, and they do have, uh, you know, a high rate of local recurrence has been reported in these uh, cases. But, um, you know, interestingly, it's, uh, you know, with, for example, CO2 laser or YAG, it's, uh, it's up to 48%, but in some cases, uh, uh, only 9%. Uh, um, in most of the studies, actually, I came across, it was only about 9 to 10% uh, in five-year follow-up. Um, and CO2 laser actually has the least um, cosmetic uh, side effects and also uh, least uh, morbidity. And um, when it comes to uh, organ sparing surgery, there are four common techniques that are used uh, when it comes to uh, the CIS, um, TA or T1 tumors. And that includes uh, circumcision, um, which requires very close follow-up. Uh, for uh, recurrence, and it's, it's actually shown to have a high rate of recurrence, up to 50%. Um, glands resurfacing, uh, which you can see here, I have uh, a few pictures, which essentially requires the dissection of uh, the skin and the epithelial connective tissue off the corpus spongiosum, um, and uh, then grafting of partial thickness um, uh, skin onto it. Uh, it has very, uh, very good um, cosmetic uh, effects, generally speaking. And uh, the rate of recurrence has been around 10, reported at around 10%. And most surgery uh, is not very commonly done, but it requires a sequential excision of uh, tissue layers with uh, a microscopic examination uh, to uh, ensure that there is no microscopic disease um, and uh, then glanzectomy, uh, again, this could be partial or total glanzectomy. And I have pictures of that here as well uh, with partial um, glanzectomy with partial thickness skin grafting as well. Now, um, based on the tumor staging, uh, the five-year recurrence uh, free survival rates for um, penile uh, sparing surgeries are 
very high with 75% um, for TA and T1 uh, or TIS disease and uh, 71% for T1. Now, um, going away from a T uh, or CIS uh, disease, when it comes to T1, it's subdivided into two categories. Um, tumors that are uh, grade one and two, or um, to high grade tumors that are grade three or four. And with, uh, with the low grade tumors, uh, the primary treatments can include wide local excision, glenzectomy, most surgery, laser therapy, or um, uh, radiotherapy. Um, and with, uh, with that in mind, uh, a small clear margin of uh, you know, less than one millimeter has been shown to have a low recurrence rate after organ sparing surgery. And it should be noted that you know, total penectomy should really only be considered um, if a, a functional penile stump cannot be preserved um, mm. after the um, excision is uh, performed. And um, when it comes to uh, the, uh, sorry, when it comes to the uh, higher grade T1 tumors, um, similarly, wide local excision is uh, recommended or partial penectomy uh, or total penectomy and radiotherapy as uh, or a, radi a combination of radio um, or chemo radiotherapy um, are recommended in those cases. With T2 or greater tumors, um, however, we no longer, uh, you know, wide local excision is no longer an acceptable me uh, method and partial or total penectomy are recommended or um, radiotherapy and, uh, or uh, chemo radiotherapy. And I want to uh, briefly touch on the uh, principles of radiotherapy, um, which include brachy um, and um, external beam radiation. And um, in T1 and T2 tumors um, with, uh, that are smaller than four centimeters and no extension beyond the coronal sulcus, so we're looking at tumors that are uh, restricted to the glands, um, these uh, tend to respond fairly well to radiotherapy, um, and it's been shown that brachytherapy actually is uh, superior uh, when it comes to the management of these with um, a higher uh, five-year uh, uh, local uh, control rate as well as um, penile preservation rates that are higher at five years. Um, and the limitation with that is that uh, it's more technically uh, challenging and it's not available every, everywhere as well. Um, but it is superior in terms of uh, overall success as well as, you know, as faster dose delivery and shorter period. Um, and uh, chemo uh, or radiotherapy can also be uh, given in a neoadjuvant uh, form uh, to fixed um, pelvic uh, inguinal uh, lymph nodes as well as uh, pelvic lymph nodes. And in um, an adjuvant setting after circumcision in T1, T2 um, disease, and um, after pelvic lymph node dissection um, with uh, multiple positive lymph nodes, and these other criteria that I've mentioned here, including uh, larger lymph nodes or lymph nodes greater than four centimeters, extranodal um, extension, and bilateral pelvic lymph nodes. All right. Um, now, for the um, you know the presence of the and extent of regional um, inguinal lymph node mets um, is the single most important prognostic factor in determining long-term survival with uh, with regard to invasive penile uh, uh, penile carcinoma, and uh, with that in mind, the lymph nodes um, are divided into. Um, two, likely three um, categories, non-palpable and palpable, with the palpable being further subdivided into non-bulky disease, um, which is less than four centimeters unilateral and not fixed, and then palpable uh, and bulky disease, which is you know uh, four centimeters, um, greater than four centimeters are fixed. Um, and I, the first thing I wanna talk about is uh, management of the non-palpable inguinal lymph nodes. Now, based on the um, uh, NCCN guidelines, um, the non-palpable inguinal lymph nodes uh, in patients who have low risk disease, that is uh, carcinoma in situ, TA or T1A uh, disease, uh, 
these, these patients have a lower risk of uh, metastasis, uh, approximately 9%. And so uh, in these patients, surveillance um, or uh, dynamic central lymph node biopsy is an acceptable um, mode of uh, treatment. Whereas um, with patients who present with um, non-palpable lymph nodes, but have uh, intermediate or high risk disease, uh, they have a 50 to 80% risk of uh, metastasis. And so uh, imaging uh, using CT or MRI is recommended. And then uh, an inguinal lymph node dissection uh, should be performed. And in centers where uh, dynamic central lymph node biopsy is uh, commonly done and uh, they have good success with it, that it is an acceptable um, measure as well. Um, just a quick description of the central lymph no uh, central node biopsy. Um, this was described approximately 30 years ago uh, for penile cancer. And um, this group, uh, Hornblas, um, in Amsterdam, uh, the Dutch group has uh, really pioneered this technology and its application for penile cancer. And um, as you see here in the um, imaging you have, uh, or in the picture that I have here, uh, you have the injection of the, um, the uh, particles, uh, the ra um, radioactive particles, uh, followed by dynamic imaging that allows you uh, to identify the specific node. So that helps with um, uh, locating the specific node. Um, and they are reporting um, false negative rates of about 7% and uh, very low complication rates with the sentinel lymph node biopsy as well. And so you can see why this would be an attractive option um, where it is commonly done and you know uh, they have good results. Uh, now, MD Anderson um, also had uh, or was uh, was doing a prospective uh, study, um, and uh, they found the overall sensitivity of this uh, to be about seventy one percent, and so they later on abandoned this. But uh, it's interesting to note that um, in uh, a, a review done by Hughes and colleagues showed that. Uh, false negative reports can actually be minimized if before doing a central lymph node biopsy, um, an ultrasound is performed in all these um, uh, non-palpable lymph node patients, followed by um, a fine needle aspiration of any suspicious nodes. And this really, and, and if, then if you want, you can proceed with a central lymph node biopsy um, if need be. And this actually reduces the risk, uh, the rate of um, false negatives um, uh, by quite a bit. Uh, this is a management algorithm uh, for low-risk patients with non-palpable lymph nodes. Um, again, this is a, a practice that's done in, um, uh, this is from MD Anderson. And uh, just to briefly touch on this, um, it doesn't necessarily, I, I mean, uh, it's not practice, it's not common practice everywhere. This is not to say that this is done everywhere. And um, they do mention uh, antibiotic um, management for four weeks in patients who present after having definitive treatment of their primary tumor. Um, and uh, if, they if they present with adenopathy to treat with antibiotics, um, again, this is an okay thing to do for patients who have low risk tumors, uh, not terribly accepted anymore in patients who have higher grade tumors. Um, and uh, in patients that have uh, T1 low grade, um, so G1, uh, grade one or two, non uh, vascular uh, invasion, uh, no vascular inv uh, invasion, again, if they're positive, a fine needle aspiration is recommended, followed by. Um, a, further ex uh, bi excisional biopsy if, uh, if need be, um, and then treatment with uh, inguinal lymph node dissection. When it comes to managing high-risk patients with uh, non-palpable uh, non lymph nodes, uh, first, it's important to identify the criteria for high-risk patients. Uh, those are patients who are uh, clinical stage T2 or greater, and their tumor shows 50% uh, that has greater than 50% poorly differentiated disease, and um, the and there's uh, lymphovascular invasion present. And these are generally uh, treated with uh, bilateral pelvic inguinal lymph, uh, or sorry, bilateral superficial inguinal lymph node dissection, 
uh, plus or minus deep inguinal lymph node uh, dissection if uh, there are positive lymph nodes in the superficial area. Uh, again, bilateral uh, dynamic central lymph node biopsy is less commonly done because not a lot of centers do it, but it is uh, an acceptable mode of um, uh, treatment uh, or approach. And uh, it, it, it is important to emphasize that delaying a treatment um, uh, and lymph or delaying a lymphatic staging uh, is associated with worse outcomes. Inguinal lymph node dissection is a, it is a technically demanding procedure. It's not very commonly done because again, um, penile cancer is not a very common disease, um, but uh, there are multiple complications, uh, seromal being right on the top there, one of the most common complications, uh, skin necrosis, wound infection, uh, tissue breakdown, um, and uh, 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 lymphedema, and DVTs uh, can be commonly done just because of the area that is being dissected. And uh, there are various techniques that are proposed to minimize complications, including um, skin flap uh, to ensure that you are preserving uh, a thin, uh, thick uh, skin flap and uh, ligating the lymphatics uh, quite vigorously as you go through the uh, procedure. And um, you can also do a sartorius flap as well in the cases where um, a deep inguinal lymph node dissection is performed to pr protect the femoral vessels. And uh, oftentimes these patients end up going home with uh, a suction, a drains to suction to prevent these lymphocytes and seromas. And uh, the what, and now we are going to move on to uh, the palpable ing inguinal lymph nodes. So in case you have uh, palpable inguinal lymph nodes, uh, as I mentioned previously, they're divided into non-bulky versus bulky disease. And um, although the traditional approach, this is way back when, was um, treatment with oral antibiotics, this is no longer um, really acceptable. And delay and definitive, because, um, you know, delay and definitive treatment um, can potentially turn a curative uh, regional MET to uh, a non-curative disease. And, uh, high, and there's high sensitivity and uh, positive predictive value for the uh, ultrasound guided FNA. And um, also there's very little risk of needle tract seeding. I'll talk about the uh, non-bulky palpable inguinal lymph nodes first. And when it comes to those, as I mentioned, it's uh, mostly uh, unilateral disease that's less than four centimeters in size, and um, or, or the largest node being uh, less than two centimeters in size. And if the primary is low risk, you can start with an FNA. Uh, and if this is negative or non-diagnostic, then you proceed with a lymph node um, biopsy, or you can just uh, directly proceed to the lymph node biopsy. Uh, the, the, uh, if the lymph node po uh, biopsy is positive, uh, it's important to treat that with uh, an inguinal lymph node dissection. And um, if it's negative, then uh, an excisional biopsy uh, is recommended and also, or you can uh, proceed with surveillance in these cases. Um, although I, I don't think many people actually do that. Um, and when it comes to the bulky um, inguinal lymph nodes, um, it, those are lymph nodes that are greater than four centimeters and mobile, or they're unilateral um, fixed, um, or bilateral lymph nodes that are fixed or mobile. Now, in both cases, um, you do you can do uh, you start with a percutaneous lymph node biopsy, uh, but in the case where it's uh, a unilateral um, lymph node uh, that's greater than four centimeters, uh, you can start with a uh, an inguinal lymph node dissection. Um, although this, you know, the consideration for this, um, I'll talk about a little bit later but most likely you would uh, proceed with new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by an inguinal lymph node dissection. If the lymph node, if in the case of bulky disease um, that's uh, fixed or bilateral, uh, it's recommended uh, to proceed with new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by either, um, uh, followed by inguinal lymph node dissection and pelvic lymph node dissection. 
And again, considerations for those I'll talk about a little bit later. But as you see, uh, management of bulking on lymph nodes uh, seems to be a multimodal approach. Uh, as in, it's not just the surgical, but also involves chemotherapy and uh, radiation therapy, potentially. Uh, there was a seminal study by Pegliaro and um, his colleagues out of MD Anderson in 2010, um, in which they tried um, chemotherapy um, in patients with bulky uh, METs um, without distant disease um, in a new adjuvant setting. They had 30 patients and they um, gave this course of paclitaxel, um, uh, uh, iphosphamide, and cisplatin, which is shortened into TIP. And um, they gave four courses, followed by surgical resection. And uh, overall, they found objective response in 50% of the patients. And um, 22, patient, uh, 22, uh, 22 patients, or 73 uh, uh, three percent of the patients had subsequent surgical resection. Uh, now, three uh, patients had no tumor uh, on the surgical specimen, and uh, nine patients had no evidence of disease um, at a median follow-up of about 34 months. Um, and um, 11 of the 22 patients who uh, went on to have uh, surgical resection uh, went on to have tumor progression. Now, overall, uh, it should be noted that the uh, chemotherapy improved uh, progression-free uh, survival as well as overall survival. And um, it was uh, noted that with chemotherapy, uh, there was uh, significantly a higher uh, incidence of, or incidence of absence of bilateral residual tumor and absence of extranodal extension. And when it comes to uh, radiotherapy with the bulky tumors, uh, Ravi and colleagues in 1994, again, this is, these are a little bit older studies, um, all of these, but um, they seem to really influence the, informa uh, the, the modes of treatment out there right now. And they demonstrate the benefit of radiation um, as a new adjuvant, adjuvant and uh, palliative uh, method in 122 patients, or sorry, 120 patients. And they found that um, in cases where, you know, patients uh, were, had uh, non-resectable disease, they were able to uh, proceed with uh, surgical, resect, uh, uh, surgical resection. And uh, palliation was offered in cases of uh, bony mets as well. Although that being said, um, there was a systematic review by the European Association of Urology, which didn't find any benefit to um, uh, radiation treatment after removal of the lymph nodes. Um, so if there was positive lymph nodes um, in, in the cases that they reviewed, they found that there was no significant benefit to radiating the area. But um, another uh, much smaller study, but a retrospective study with um, Chen and colleagues uh, reported significantly less uh, regional failure rates uh, in patients who had two or more positive lymph nodes or extranodal extension. Uh, who went on to receive um, external beam radiation after having a pelvic lymph node or uh, having a inguinal lymph node dissection. Now, in patients with bulky inguinal lymph node mets, um, in uh, inguinal lymph node dissection should really be considered if they're very highly symptomatic and the disease is considered to be uh, resectable, completely resectable. Otherwise, they should undergo uh, chemotherapy um, or chemoradiation. And uh, in cases of ipsilateral pelvic lymph node dissection, uh, an ipsilateral uh, pelvic lymph node dissection should be considered in patients um, w that end up having two or more positive lymph nodes uh, on superficial and deep inguinal lymph node dissection. Now, this could be done um, intraoperatively, so where you send it to pathologist who examines the pelvic lymph node uh, or the inguinal lymph node package and says, yes, there are multiple lymph nodes, and then you can proceed with uh, the ipsilateral pelvic lymph node dissection or it could be done at a later date. If a patient is uh, found to have external extension on pathologic review um, or viable cancer after um, inguinal lymph node dissection, then adjuvant uh, systemic chemotherapy should be offered. And uh, when it comes to pelvic lymph node dissection, it should be considered uh, for patients um, who have two or more positive inguinal lymph nodes with um, and uh, patients who have 
mats that are greater than three centimeters um, in diameter, uh, or they have inguinal extranodal extension. And uh, going from unilateral to bilateral uh, pelvic lymph node dissection should be considered uh, if there are more than four pelvic lymph uh, or inguinal lymph nodes positive. Uh, based on that, um, the, a group um, uh, uh, in 2014 showed that on multivariate analysis, they did um, they, they were looking at uh, a cohort of about 188 inguinal lymph node uh, dissections that had, um, and they looked at pelvic lymph node um, uh, mets in these cases. And approximately 31% of these patients had pelvic lymph node mets as well. And uh, a multivariate analysis showed that um, patients were more likely to have pelvic lymph node mets if um, three, they had three or more um, inguinal lymph nodes um, or they were greater than three centimeters as previously mentioned. And uh, interestingly, the proportion of patients with pelvic lymph node mets um, increased from zero if they had none of those risk factors, the above three risk factors, to uh, fifty-seven percent if they had all three of those risk factors. Uh, and uh, again, uh, touching, uh, talking about whether uh, you know pelvic lymph nodes should be uh, considered, uh, this group out of Netherlands um, performed uh, pelvic lymph node dissections prophylactically um, on all the patients that pre presented with um, penile cancer and uh, uh, or an inguinal lymph node um, extension of disease. And they found that um, inguinal extranodal extension and the presence of two or more inguinal lymph nodes was predictive of pelvic lymph node um, positivity. All right. Um, now, when it comes to surveillance for penile cancer, we've treated uh, the primary and you know have gone through the pelvic lymph node dissection. Um, it's interesting because the incidence of uh, recurrence is actually uh, seems to be um, uh, high relatively in this study that uh, was uh, done by um, Leite and colleagues. Uh, they looked at pattern of recurrence in 700 patients and approximately 30% of them had a recurrence. Uh, about 90% of, the, uh, of these were in the first five years. Uh, patients with distal recurrences um, had very, very poor re uh, prognosis, uh, not lasting more than 22 months. Um, and uh, patients with local recurrences had better prognosis in terms of overall survive survival. Um, and the surveillance strategy uh, for these, you know, it depends on uh, what the initial treatment has been and also what the lymph node uh, status was on these patients. But uh, overall, when it's patients who have um, lower, disease, uh, lower grade disease, uh, so they receive topical uh, treatment, laser therapy, radiotherapy, or wide local excision, uh, these patients uh, require follow-up fairly routinely for the first couple of years. So every three months followed by um, every six months in the next three to five years, and then every year for five to 10 years. Um, and then and in patients who undergo partial panectomy for uh, a low grade uh, pro, uh, or total panectomy, yeah, these patients require um, less rigorous um, sur uh, surveillance. So every six months for the first couple of years, and then every 12 months after that. Um, but in patients with, uh, again, I won't belabor going through all of this. Uh, I'm sure you can all read uh, the um, overall uh, slide. But uh, the important thing is it is important to have appropriate follow-up for these patients, and um, especially in patients who have a higher grade of disease and uh, pelvic lymph nodes that are positive. And uh, when it comes to management of recurrence, as I mentioned, recurrence is... Um, high at about 30% or so in these patients. And um, the modes of treatment are outlined in the NCC, uh, NCCN guidelines. Uh, and it depends on whether or not the recurrence is invasive or non-invasive and whether it's within the inguinal lymph nodes. Again, I won't belabor going through the specifics of this. But um, in conclusion, you know, penile sparing uh, surgical approaches should be considered um, for low-grade disease, um, uh, 
and uh, with favorable ana uh, anatomy. And uh, patients that have high risk uh, disease should have inguinal lymph nodes evaluated. And uh, with bulky adenopathy, uh, it sh they should have multimodal therapy. And uh, in terms of future directions, I, I, I do want to talk about a few couple, a uh, few things here. And uh, one thing that was very notable is that there's a lack of level one evidence um, overall, and that's one of the things that you see uh, across the board. Uh, and all these recommendations and guidelines are uh, generally not on level one evidence. Penile cancer is a rare tumor, so that's understandable. But um, there is an international rare cancer initiative um, that opened an international penile advanced cancer trial. Impact, um, which is a multinational collaboration uh, hoping to recruit approximately 400 patients with clinically palpable lymph nodes uh, over a five year period. And uh, these patients are to be randomized into um, upfront, upfront ILND, um, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, followed by um, ILND, or neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy, followed by ILND. And um, they're also going to look at prophylactic, uh, prophylactic pelvic lymph nodes um, to see whether this will improve patient overall outcomes. And um, I should note that uh, Dr. Black is the Canadian um, urologic champion for this study in Canada. And um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Juanita Kruk is the um, radiologist. She's a radiation oncologist, I should say, uh, who is practicing out of the uh, interior. And she is the PI, um, the Canadian PI for this study. Um, the genetics of penile cancer are also interesting. And um, inter uh, the reason why is because uh, there's a lot of tumors uh, that are found to have um, a relatively high rate of um, PD-1 expression. And uh, the, this rationalizes the use of uh, PD-1 inhibition for uh, clinical trials. And there have been a, multi uh, there have been a number of trials that are um, actually undergoing uh, this, and they're looking at also epigenetic and RNA signatures um, for METs and survival rates. And um, these ongoing trials, uh, uh, this is a list of them right now that are uh, going on. Again, these are all rare cancers, and most of them are looking at uh, rare GU tumors, um, but also because uh, squamous cell carcinoma is studied uh, in a variety of contexts, including you know various other parts of the body. Um, then uh, the information here is actually, um, or the information from those studies can actually be extrapolated to penile cancer. Uh, in the end, I'd like to thank Dr. Black for um, his um, very thorough um, input on this uh, presentation. And also thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh, for um, providing me with the pictures for the uh, case that uh, I presented initially.